Our story begins in Southern California. It's about invisible people who preyed on invisible people and an industry that preyed on them all. Sometimes the criminal justice system It was more like guilty until proven innocent. Isn't all that just? Which stage of sleepwalking involves murder? That's scary. Of course it is. <laughs> you don't give up, do you? I'm Jenna Friedman, and this is Indefensible. In our youth-obsessed society, as women age, we become invisible. So I hear. But as you'll learn in this next story, there are some advantages to invisibility, like getting away with murder. Helen Golay and Olga Rutterschmidt were like a real-life Thelma and Louise. But instead of running their car off a cliff, they ran it into... We'll get to that later. I had never heard of anything like this. It was like a movie. Veteran AP journalist Linda Deutsch reported on the case. It was a story that nobody could have sold to the studios and found plausible. And do you think nobody could have sold it because the women in it were over 40? No, I think it couldn't have been sold because the story itself was so weird. What were your first impressions of Helen and Olga when you saw them? Well, neither of them was very attractive. On July 21st, 2005, a body is discovered in an alley in West Hollywood. There are no eyewitnesses, but it appears to be a hit and run. The victim is identified as 50-year-old Kenneth McDavid. Pastor Charles Suheda met Kenneth through an outreach program that Suheda ran at a Hollywood church. Ken himself was um, very much introverted, and he was still very active in writing. He was an aspiring writer. At the time, Kenneth was experiencing homelessness, and the church's program was a source of support for him. But one day, Kenneth stopped showing up. We didn't always see people all the time. Their lifestyle can be very transient. It's easy for them to go missing. That's and correct. no one would that, even notice. Nobody's going to notice. Kenneth's body is found beside a bike, with one of the tires off as if he had been changing it. Only the tire isn't flat. The scene looks suspicious, but so do a lot of things in L.A. Deputy District Attorney Robert Grace. So many people in Los Angeles are struck and killed by motor vehicles. So these hit and run investigations are almost impossible to piece together because you don't have uh, on-site homicide detectives who know what to look for. They're so overwhelmed with so many different types of hit and runs that they might not be able to have the bandwidth to pay the amount of attention that they would need. Absolutely. There are a few leads until police get a surprising tip from an unlikely source. As writer Paul Brownfield explains. The insurance investigator for Mutual of New York sees that Kenneth McDavid an apparently homeless person has a million dollars in life insurance on, on him. And the beneficiaries won't talk to him. The beneficiaries are Helen Golay and Olga Rutterschmidt. So he's contacting Olga and Helen. They're not returning his calls. They're not answering his knocks at the door. So that's, you know, sort of red flag number one. Once the insurance investigator reports his findings to the LAPD, the stalled homicide investigation gets a renewed focus. Now that insurance fraud and a f ton of money might be involved. Meanwhile, as luck would have it, Helen and Olga suddenly become a lot more visible. The detective who was working Mr. McDavis' hit and run incident, he had a, an interesting exchange with Helen and Olga who were demanding that the police sign off on the release of McDavid's body. So Helen Golay got into a, a big verbal dispute with the detective. A colleague heard the name Helen and Olga and said, Helen and Olga, I had a case like five years ago where uh, Helen and Olga were trying to retrieve the body for insurance claims. Sure enough, it's the same Helen and Olga. The man's name is Paul Vados. 
He also was experiencing homelessness and also died in a suspicious hit and run, just like Kenneth McDavid. All the insurance companies remembered Helen based upon the difficult conversations that they had with her. She was like the original Karen. <laughs> yes, she, she would be the, the, the grandmother of Karen's. Huh, so what's Olga like? She was very eccentric, uh, very difficult personality, very self-absorbed. Once she went to a coffee shop, she got into a confrontation with another customer, it escalated, the customer tased her. In 2006, Los Angeles police are investigating the apparent hit-and-run death of a man named Kenneth McDavid. When they discover that two women, Helen Golay and Olga Rutterschmidt, are beneficiaries in a life insurance policy they've taken out in his name. Authorities soon learn that Helen and Olga are connected to another hit-and-run of a man named Paul Vados, who died five and a half years prior. Now, police and the insurance companies are looking into both deaths. And Helen and Olga are suddenly on their radar. Helen Golay, 77, was born Helen Salisbury in Eastland County, Texas, and grew up between relatives' homes. Olga emigrated from Hungary in 57. They met at a gym, of all places. Olga was a fitness buff, and Helen also went to the gym. The story went that they would like go to hotels, sit out, pretend to be guests, sit out by the pool, stealing purses. They did clearly seem to be into identity theft. They found each other, in a sense, the two grifters. Yeah. It turns out Helen and Olga aren't just grifters. They're involved in a much bigger scheme. They took out around seven insurance policies on Paul Vados and uh, 13 um, on Kenneth McDavid, and I think they might have tried to take out more. It's not even the number of policies as much as their carelessness that tips off the insurance investigator. They were pretty loosey-goosey sometimes with, you know, um, the details. Sometimes Kenneth McDavid's address was actually Helen's address, or Olga was Kenneth McDavid's aunt to sort of create the, the impression of a relationship, a beneficiary relationship. Bolstered by the insurance investigators' findings, authorities begin to put together their case, but they have to act fast. The police were now surveilling Helen and Olga, and they had determined that they were well on their way to um, trying to uh, set up um, a third victim for a murder. They had picked out a guy who was homeless and actually got him to sign insurance documents. The police were afraid uh, for this guy's life. While police don't have enough evidence to charge Helen and Olga with murder, they're able to issue an arrest warrant on federal mail fraud charges. I have to call my lawyer. What is happening here? On May 18, 2006, the LAPD, FBI, and a load of other people make their move. Ms. Galay, my name is Sam Mayros. I'm with the FBI. You're under arrest for mail fraud. Mail fraud? Yes. That's right, Helen. Mail fraud. And for a white-collar crime as boring as mail fraud, authorities sure do pull out all the stops. There were 20 to 30 police cars. 20 to 30 police cars? Yes. So it's like raid on bin Laden level response. Yes, it's, it's, it's an unusual amount of law enforcement. But not when you f with the multi-billion dollar insurance industry. After Hell Olga's arrest, can we call them that? Police devise a plan. They put them together in the same holding room. Huh, what could go wrong? Why did you make all this extra insurances? Too many you had. There's a limit. You I can't do that many. Mm -hmm. You were greedy. That's the problem. Olga, shut the f up. You're on camera. Do you think, had the insurance investigator not tipped off law enforcement to Helen and Olga, that the women would have gotten away with the second murder? Yeah, because the first murder is a cold case at that point, and the second murder is of a, of a homeless person. 
I think what was overlooked was their crimes exposed shocking loopholes in the, in the life insurance industry and in the insurance industry as a whole that, like, people just don't really want to, I guess, uh, look at. It almost makes me want to take out a life insurance policy so that in the event that I get murdered, somebody will find my killer and that somebody is a private insurance company who has money on the line. Yeah. After Helen Golay and Olga Rutterschmidt are arrested on federal mail fraud charges, police search Helen's apartment and find a critical new piece of evidence, a post-it note with the license plate and VIN number of a Mercury Sable. Police were stumped. They thought insurance fraud might be all they could prove. But then a big break. Police say they found one of the murder weapons, this 1999 Mercury Sable station wagon. They say the two women had bought the car and sold it right after McDavid was killed. Two sexy senior citizens behind bars on federal fraud charges, and they are looking down the wrong end of the barrel of murder one charges as well. Defense attorney Roger Diamond represented Helen during the trial. What was Helen and Olga's greatest error, other than being guilty? Well, a number of things. I'm Helen's defense attorney. I still have loyalty to her. But it certainly didn't hurt the investigation to have the insurance company d working side by side with the prosecution. The prosecutors had the full muscle of the insurance industry to help them. And you had a tired woman over 70 who might also be a murderer helping you. That's right. According to the Los Angeles Times, at trial, Diamond argued that the insurance companies were colluding with prosecutors and distorting the evidence because they had a financial interest in the women's convictions. In retrospect, it probably was not proper to claim that the insurance companies had some kind of motive. I didn't mean to defame an insurance company. Now you're turning in favor of the insurance companies. Why the turn? because I'm talking to somebody who's very bright and sharp, and I'm worried that she might get me to say something inappropriate. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. In April 2008, Helen Golay and Olga Rutterschmidt are both convicted of first-degree murder. Two women, the so-called black widows, will not return to normal free life. Kenneth McDavid and Paul Vados needed a helping hand. Instead, these unfortunate men were sacrificed on your altars of greed. So Helen and Olga are in prison for life and for good reason. But what about the insurance companies that perhaps could have done a little more due diligence on their policyholders before anyone got murdered? Why didn't this tragic high profile case bring about any increased scrutiny of them. Perhaps because they subsidize the bureau that's supposed to be scrutinizing them. The insurance companies as a whole subsidize um, the California Insurance um, Bureau because they all um, contribute to a fund that helps to try to battle insurance fraud. Does that fund subsidize police investigations? They do. The, the DA's office has an insurance fraud bureau that's partially funded by uh, money that we get to, from the state. The insurance companies do that. The in entertainment industry does that. The automobile industry does that. Did you know that private industries help fund law enforcement departments across the country? Because I sure didn't. It's so crazy, because when you zoom out and you look at this crisis of homelessness and all the money kind of going around at the top and then all the people at the bottom just kind of falling even further through the cracks. It's such an interesting system that we live in. Yeah, well, it's not cost effective to all of the aforementioned industries that we we're talking about to deal with, you know, actual, a societal problem. <laughs> actual human lives. <laughs> cool. 
At least in this case, the partnership between law enforcement and the private insurance industry, which sounds like the worst buddy cop movie ever, did bring Paul Vados and Kenneth McDavid's killers to justice. But there is one more person connected to this case I want to talk to, and that's because she's connected to almost every high-profile criminal case in Los Angeles. I'm so excited to talk to this next guest who represented the victim's families in this case. We're going to talk about the case as well as other issues involving women and invisibility. I'm just waiting for her to get here. Does anyone? Hi, sorry I didn't see you there. That's OK. Iconic victim's rights attorney and voice for the voiceless, Gloria Allred, represented the families of the victims in this case. I think it's absolutely an outrage. And I hope that anyone who ever thinks of preying on the homeless will understand there are going to be very serious consequences. You seem to have your hands on everything, not in a Cuomo sort of way. But my question is, how do you do it? Are there two of you? I actually have a law firm. OK. You're being and modest. we have 13 attorneys. This is a team effort. Uh, all credit to the team. You started practicing law in an era when men got away with everything. When do you think that era will end? Never. In your mind, who is more hated in America, women or lawyers? Uh, I'm not a sociologist. What drew you to this particular case, other than that the men involved were dead? Well, there was no ability for the victims to find the whole truth, except through this case. Do you think that invisibility played a role in Helen and Olga being able to get away with what they got away with for so long? I do think there is an enormous amount of sexism and ageism as women get older. Do you think that they would have gotten away with murder the third time had it not been for the insurance company sending an investigator to look into the case? Well, there were many fortuitous uh, incidents that took place. And I might add, the two women, like most unsuccessful felons, did not commit the perfect murders. They thought they did but they were not smarter than law enforcement. Which is saying a lot. <laughs> it's, it's saying a, a lot. Do you have hope for the future of the criminal justice system being a little bit more equitable than it is now? With all due respect, hope is a child's word. And I don't invest my time in hoping because we have to work for change. Hoping never gives us anything. I feel the same way, Mom. Sorry, Gloria. Actually, many of my clients call me Mama Gloria. Thank you so much, Gloria, for your time. Keep fighting the fight. Thank you. So what are Helen and Olga up to now? Olga's really obsessed with Helen can afford a better attorney, and you know Helen's going to get out, and I'm going to rot here. And it's hard not to feel sorry for a person like that. If it's any consolation to Olga, it doesn't look like Helen is getting out anytime soon. Helen, uh, she recently filed a, uh, a claim that she was uh, wrongfully convicted. What, what? Because our office created a wrongful conviction unit. So she, she let me speak to your manager at your office. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's weird because um, when she filed the claim, I had been named head of the wrongful conviction unit. The person she asked to speak to the manager is the manager. <laughs> <laughs> if this case teaches us anything other than don't underestimate women over 70, it's that in America, sometimes justice can prevail as long as private money pays for it. Brought to you by the National Association of Insurance Companies of America.